ginagawa po namin ngayon is really to organize the team. No? So, may kinakausap kami ang local scientists, Filipino scientists, and we will be taking on some also from foreign expertise. Karin to know this morning, uh, some of the expertise coming from Japan. Uh, we've also considered, of course, in the last forum, expertise in Galing to Singapore and Galing to the US. No? So, there will be a composite team, different disciplines uh, represented by Filipino scientists, with advisory and expertise from foreign as well. Well, we want to assemble the team by August. Uh, chaka, and many of these have actually already been involved more or less in assessing what is happening in the Manila Bay Reclamation. No? So we will start from zero. The Manila Bay Sustainable Development Plan that we have this morning, that we sent to the Delta Rest, um, we will use that as a recommended baseline uh, for the community impact assessment. Pero maraming pa siguro ng data na kailangan makapag. Next question, SMNI. Secretary, uh, gaano po kahalaga itong nangyayari ngayon uh, together with experts sa pag-craft natin ng uh, policies regarding po sa reclamation projects dito sa bansa? Actually, napakahalaga po kasi as you know, we are an archipelagic country so andan po natin ang islands and regions. Uh, reclamation of course is one way forward in terms of the economic development of the different areas. However, kailangan po talaga masinsinan ang approach po natin. Uh, we invite the different perspectives of all groups. Uh, alam niyo po, in the last uh, forum, we had groups from Pumalakaya, yung mga fisher folks, as well as mga scientists uh, galim po sa atin, uh, different experts. It's important po na ma-ventilate, ma-articulate po natin ang mga perspectives ng mga respective sectors na ito. Kasi po, siguro po in the previous uh, permitting processes, hindi po masyadong transparent, uh, hindi po masyadong uh, consultative. No? Uh, in terms of trying to include the many different disciplines and expertise na meron po tayo dito sa Pilipinas. So, Filipino scientists, uh, hopefully to be leading, as I said, yung community impact assessment team. Ang pinakahalaga po dito is yung approach na yon. Hindi po pwedeng isa-isa lang po ang pag-evaluate ng environmental impact ng mga reclamation projects. Kailangan po together. No? Kasi together po nag-feedback at nag-drive po ng different changes dito sa mga bodies of water natin and on land as well. Secretary, para lang mas maintindihan ng ating mga kababayan, what will happen po ba if hindi nag-plansyado uh, yung mga polisiya natin sa reclamation project? Anong impact nito sa ekonomiya? Anong impact nito sa environment natin? Actually, narinig niyo po, no, may mga tinatawag na externalities na negative. No? So may mga ecosystem services po tayo. For example, flood management ng mga mangroves na pwede mong mawala kung hindi po sila kasali dito sa valuation and assessment ng mga proyektong ito. At hindi po sila isa-isa, as I said, no, na pwedeng kunin ng individual. No? Kailangan isang malaking ecosystem, yung Manila Bay region, uh, at doon po kailangan ang impact assessment, holistic, hindi po siya tingi-tingi. Ang importante dyan is may tinatawag po tayong unintended consequences, uh, negative adaptation na pwede mangyari. No? So, ang kailangan po talaga is kung may social, may economic, may environmental, uh, na evaluation together, uh, we can look at the comprehensive value na talagang uh, mapupunta dito sa communities natin, dito sa mga developers natin, dito sa gobyerno natin. Next, from Taranyahan Net Radio Worldwide. Uh, Secretary, tanong ko lang po sa darating na zona ng ating Pangulo. Kung mga napag-usapan po ba dito, maririnig po ng ating mga kababayan? Well, hopefully po, uh, alam na po, po natin na si Presidente po are very high on the agenda yung environment no? sa unang zona. Binanggit niya po ano, in preservation of the environment and the preservation of life. At doon po rin, binanggit niya na climate change is very important. May water concern po tayo na narinig niyo po today, no? may, uh, may maraming nagsasabi na water is an issue dito sa reclamation. So we know that consistently the President will be making a statement that environmental sustainability is important for inclusive development. So doon po sana uh, Hindi po natin, pero confident po tayo na in this presidency, nakikita po ni President Bongbong ang actual link between climate change, environment, and human development. Next, from PTV. Sir, um, question po, parang yung sa kaalaman ng publiko. Um, ano po yung nakikita nito mga ito ba yan in terms 
alam na po natin na yung batas ay ginagawa periodically no may nagpapasok ng bill nagdadrop ng bill na, na basically sa Congress at sa Senate na, na approve ang importante po ay siguro uh, as knowledge grows uh, ang kalaman po natin ay talaga naman dynamic no uh, uh, kailangan po ang ating mga polisiya ang ating mga batas ating mga implementing rules and regulations nagde-reflect po no ng changes dito sa kaalaman no sa science and technology sa mga innovation na nangyayari itong mga forum na ito ay isang importanteng bahagi ng learning process in terms of government sa changes na kailangan gawin for policy for practice and for for the legal basis ang pinaka importante po dito is whenever there is something that is a pronouncement and for example yung mandamus po natin kailangan po may interpret yan uh, in the context of kung ano na po ang mga developments sa science and technology as a policy. You know? uh, in order for us to to perform our obligation towards the Mandamus ruling and towards the communities na na-affect po dito sa Manila Bay. So ito mga forum na ito ay isang parang bahagi no, ng tinatawag nating discourse o discourse. No? na sana po uh, makakatulong sa pag-formulate, pag-update, pag-generate ng bagong batas o polisiya eh, at mga practices no, na based on international practice. Pero dito rin po sa mga scientifico na talaga po um, medyo um, well known po sila internationally pero hindi po natin masyado sila kilala in terms of their contribution to economic and social and environmental development. So, ito po yung platform nila. Last in my part po, um, um, ang um, can you cite sectors po na makikinapang sa mga ganyan dialog po? Ah, siyempre po. Opo. Well, the construction sector for one, no? Kasi uh, core, core business po nila yan. So, how is it that they can become more sustainable and more risk sensitive dito po sa panahon ng climate change, for example? Uh, ang fishery sector, we hope to actually have the DA step up dito sa Mandamus po, uh, ang DA ang in charge, no? ang BIFAR ang in charge in order for the biological restoration to actually support yung fisheries at yung kung ano kung pag-aktividad po ng mga fishing communities po natin. Uh, DNR, we learn a lot from these types of fora. No? Kasi po, uh, kumitsan, uh, siguro sa kita po ng gobyerno, uh, we talk to each other. We don't talk to others in other sectors. So ito po yung panahon para talaga po uh, itong mga complex na problema po natin ay magbibigyan ng, ng different perspectives in order to solve this problem. So, DNR, DA, DOH po sa kalaman tungkol sa water at sanitation kasi po uh, sa kalaman po natin, ang pinaka-importante po dito sa pagsasalusay ng mga coastal areas natin ay yung practice na paghigop po ng tubig sa lakes ground. Uh, ang paghigop po ng tubig, minsan po, hindi masyadong maayos ang water quality po niyan. So the health and sanitation issues related to coastal development, makikinaban rin po ang DOH, for example. Last question from Manila Times. Good afternoon po, Sec. Um, with the number po of proposed reclamation projects, can the DANR ensure po ba na it won't pose any harm to our marine biodiversity? At this point po, let me be frank with you, no? we are seriously concerned with the way um, the level of science and the level of evaluation that is available to us as a department no, uh, can meet up with the challenges po on marine biodiversity. Hindi po lang yung marine biodiversity ang, ang uh, kailangan tignan. May sinatawag po tayong chemical oceanography, kung ano po yung composition ng katubigan po natin no, in terms of the ocean. Meron yung physical oceanography, kung pa paano po uh, basically gumagalaw ang tubig, no, waves, and and how that also affects the circulation of the spawning no, uh, ng ating mga fisheries. So, all of these are interrelated. Ang ginagawa po nat namin ngayon is really to build capacity. No, and we do that by outreach. We reach out to UPMSI, for example, UPLB, no? of course, you know that different mga higher education institutions and, of course, expertise around the world. So, yun pong ginagawa po namin. We are at the point where we need to acknowledge no, that these types of outreach are necessary for us to effectively do our job. Mm -hmm. Uh, AO 2019, no? Dash for um, 
the five uh, mandatory requirements no, uh, of um, of uh, the TRA on, on um, the review process. Um, but the review process, as we, as Attorney Literal says, if we already have the air clearance, um, particularly from the DNR and the PCC, the, the advisory opinion from DNR becomes uh, redundant. Uh, it might not be good at the DNA, but it may be redundant at the point because uh, EO 74 highlights the value of the area clearance and the PCC. Um, but interestingly, what you also highlighted is that um, the MOU does come, uh, you know, once the application of the NGU uh, is given to the PRA, only then are the requirements, uh, uh, only then is the MOU signed for the submission of the documents. But the joint venture process comes after the approval process. No? So I think um, those are some of the critical steps uh, that we, we, we take away from, from the presentation of uh, Attorney Lula. Would you want to add something to that? Yes, ma'am. Um, however, yung sinabi natin na uh, the approval process comes after, uh, the JP arrangement comes after the approval process. Uh, but sometimes the applicant or the LGU, NGA, and the GOCC applies to the PRA to already with a joint venture partner. So that's why I was uh, um, stressing a while ago that there are two stages of approval approved competitive challenge at the level of the proponent and also a competitive challenge at the level of the Okay, so that's very interesting. Please, uh, let's spark those two points. So I need you to, uh, you know, come back to them later on in the QLA because then we will be able to unpack some of the critical issues that we have, you know, around uh, regulation issues in the Philippines and perhaps to further clarify, you know, uh, and um, enlighten us, you know, on the, the, the policies around uh, reclamation and moving ahead. We have um, a very distinguished member, you know, of uh, DNR, uh, who coordinates all international environmental concerns, including the implementation of international environmental treaties and participation of the Philippines in international environmental bodies and, and conferences. Friends, let's all welcome DNR Under Secretary for Policy Planning and International Affairs, um, Attorney Jonas Leones. Actually, this is a shortened version of the presentation of Patron Literal. So I'll be presenting, highlighting the DNR's issuance of the data clearance and ECC for proposed reclamation project. Next slide. But uh, before I, I uh, proceed with the uh, process involved in the ECC, uh, ECC and GAR clearance, let me first give you a uh, reclamation at a glance. Okay. <coughs> so it is not, we cannot debate on the issue that uh, Reclamation sparks economic development, increasing the demand for economic and social needs, societal needs. And uh, it's also, we all agree that uh, it generates revenues for the government. But uh, we can also uh, know that there are some policy gaps in the current reclamation process and procedures and current existence because we have been experiencing a lot of criticisms in terms of uh, implementing the reclamation projects. Next slide. So you can see, can you go up to the uh, first slide? You can see the pictures there. Uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the most popular reclamations in Metro Manila. The Moa area is actually the reclamation area. And of course, the Lord Harbor, uh, you can see the picture. Next slide. So we also um, secured uh, copies or photos of uh, some reclamations in, uh, outside the country. And some of these were discussed by the previous uh, Panelists. You can see uh, on the left uh, photo, the Rotterdam Reclamation. Um, actually, it serves as a, uh, the Europe's largest seaport. And then, of course, the Hong Kong Reclamation Projects. So, they use the reclamation for their uh, uh, condominiums and high rise buildings. And then, uh, on your extreme left, the Marine, Marine Dubai in Singapore, most of you have done to. Marine and Dubai in Singapore, and uh, um, those infrastructures are located, situated in the area. 
and uh, this uh, a team called Gripia, uh, how they get the power uh, of this Marina Bay, Marina Bay from the Dublin Waste to Energy Project underneath the, the Reclamation Project. And then you can see also the Kansai uh, Japan, as we presented uh, this a uh, while ago. Next time. So also in, 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 the, in the Philippines, uh, we have also uh, received or uh, got some pictures of the post reclamation in Cordoba Cebu. So this will, uh, after reclamation, this will probably look like uh, in this area. Then we also have uh, uh, projects, proposed reclamation project in the middle portal of Marina Bay and uh, the Lapachea. Just to give you the profile of the reclamation projects in the Philippines, you can see here that uh, uh, based on the PRK data, of course it's already derived So 27% of our reclamation project in the Philippines are initiated by the private companies. 12% of the reclamation in the Philippines are initiated by the government. And then 20% by uh, uh, LGUs with private partners. And the remaining 40, uh, 47% uh, these reclamations are uh, initiated by the local government units. So these are the profile of our reclamation project. So these are some of the reclamation projects. I, I decided to show this uh, table just to show you the, the total cost, probable cost that uh, they will be paid when it comes to reclamation. So for the nine projects, reclamation projects in NCR, the total estimated project cost based on submitted project descriptions total about 330.6 billion. Next slide. So in Cebu, we have also gathered information that uh, those areas are also subject of reclamations. Uh, based on the data we, we, uh, we yes, got, no mention of the cost. No? Some of the projects uh, did not mention the cost of the project. Next slide. So we now proceed to the general process of the issues of the clearance. Next slide. So as a background there, on 10 July 2018, DAO number 2018-14 was issued to prescribing the guidelines of the issues of air clearance for reclamation and proclamation special patent over grid lands. So this, uh, this uh, DAO, um, pursuant to section 140, uh, 146, and other relevant policies, EO number 146 delegates previously to the NEDA board the power of the president to approve reclamation projects. But later on, this was amended by EO 74. In section 4 of DAO 2018 uh, it also defined that the air clearance as a document issued by the NR, secretary declaring an area suitable for reclamation is defined under the DAO. And this was also stressed by Atomic uh, Liberati in his uh, presentation. Next slide. So, just to reiterate again, in our DAO section 5, DAO 2018 14, it is provided there that no reclamation project shall be allowed unless an area clearance is persecuted from the NR. The clearance, which already includes covered environmental compliance certificate or any potential impact to the environment, as one of its requirements. So, these guidelines uh, address the long-standing issue on uh, issue on what to secure first, ECC or reclamation. Under the under this DAO, it is clarified that when we issue the agreements, the ECC must already be incorporated. In this section, also it stressed the validity of the air clearance and the ECC. It is mentioned there that uh, five years after the issuance of the air clearance and of the ECC, when there is no activities undertaken. The DNR has the authority to cancel the area clearance and the ACC. So on May 13, May 22, the DNR also issued uh, amendment of DAO 20 last 2011, actually streamlining the securing of the ACC. Uh, in the process, uh, uh, in the original process, there's still evaluation to be done, but under this, uh, under this uh, amendment, it is enough that uh, the proponent can already secure the ACC for as long as they can uh, provide or provide a document saying that they are already uh, submitted an application for the clearance. Next slide. So on February 2019, uh, 
EO74 was issued, repeating both EO779 and EO146. Actually, this now transferred the authority of approving reclamation project from NEDA to PRD. So, we need to say it's not the PRD uh, who exercised the authority of the president to approve reclamation project. And also in Section 3 of 74, uh, I just mentioned there that the uh, um, advisory opinion for the DNA and Environment and Sustainability, if any proposed tradition, um, shall be secured. But this was clarified by uh, Attorney Literal that uh, um, it's not applicable because uh, uh, for me, uh, how can we give an opinion if there is no yet scientific basis to give the opinion? So. Uh, by, being, by mere submission of uh, e security of the air clearance and ECC will uh, suffice to serve as the advisory opinion. Okay. Moreover, Section 4 of EO 74 provides that no reclamation shall be approved by the PRD without the required air clearance and environmental compliance certificate to be issued by the DNA. So this is very clear. Next slide. But you will note uh, when the IRR was issued by, uh, by the, the PRD, so they decided uh, on when, when the ECC or air clearance should be secured. So I think that's the, I think uh, we should be evaluating that, uh, that the process uh, later on. Then section 4.2 of the EO is down the mandatory requirements in the application of reclamation, which include air clearance and ECC, among the five, as mentioned by uh, Mom Jack. In the flowchart for processing of application to reclaim issued by the PRA, the DNA issuance of air clearance and ECC will fall under this process. Proponent is given a maximum of 24 months for the execution of the MOU within which to comply with the complete mandatory requirements for payment of the DPP. So we need to say, as mentioned in the presentation of Attorney General, there is already an LOI application and there is also a prequalification requirement and some energies have already secured the JBA when they apply when they apply for ECC and air clearance. So these are the things that we need to uh, evaluate further. Next slide. So this is the uh, summary of the uh, uh, process mentioned by by Attorney Teral. Shinorten lang namin sinamalize. You can see that. Inspection 
of the pre-qualification of the area for reclamation. In this composite, they will be verifying personally the area, whether there is uh, overlapping of uh, some some projects in the area. And then uh, the, con uh, the composite team would prepare narrative report to the red, including the pre-qualification of the area for reclamation. If based on the evaluation of the project is not visible, then the red will deny or reject the application. But if the, based on the composite the, uh, review or inspection, the document or the area is free from any conflict or overlap, uh, they will recommend to the red the, the narrative, the, the, through the narrative report. And uh, the red will issue notice to the applicant directing the latter to submit project description for the scoping and geohazard investigation report. So it is only the time that the, the proponent or the applicant will secure the ECC. So the EMD will uh, look for this if there is endorsement uh, from the red whether they can already secure the ECC. And then EMD Central evaluates the EIS, uh, uh, EIS or IA report, and then if uh, the impact cannot be mitigated, the EMD will reject the application for ECC. But if the EMB uh, uh, finds merit on the application, then uh, it will endorse the ECC to the red. And the composite team submits to the red the application documents, the, including the ECC with the area clearance draft. And then the red endorses the application document together with the draft area clearance and the ECC to the secretary. And the secretary approves the area clearance and the Office of the Secretary of the Speech, the approved area clearance to the Office of the Red, and the ORED uh, transmits approved area clearance to the applicant, and the applicant can proceed with the process of reclamation. Now, to summarize the, the, the chart, the, the flow, uh, the process flow of uh, the DNR and the, and the PRA, next slide. So I, I lifted this uh, uh, flow to uh, the representation of Ms. Andres Huego of the environmental planner. Can you get through? Yeah. So you can look, you can see in this in this uh, flow the summarized uh, uh, flow process flow of uh, reclamation projects using the chart uh, process flow at uh, uh, PRA and the DNR. You will note here that the uh, yung situation wherein the local government will uh, enter into JPA uh, with the private sector. There will be unsolicited, unsolicited uh, proposal, and then this will be evaluated by the local government unit. And the LGU will uh, enter into a joint venture agreement with the private firm, and this will be submitted to the PRA LGU. And it is only after the MOU. Um, execution that the proponent will undertake the ECC or the area clearance. So we need to say the concern here is that there are already investments cost on the part of the proponent when they secure the ECC. So uh, as mentioned by Jeff, maybe we can uh, uh, look at this uh, to determine is it the appropriate time where the ECC process or ECC requirement of area clearance should be secured after the uh, uh, joint venture or the MOU has been executed. So based on this, we need to have no problems, no gaps that we need to review. So, so I have also mentioned that, next slide. Also, society to hear some of the policy concerns with, between the DNR and the PRA. So I mentioned here, we included here, the question of where and when will environmental impact assessment, risk assessment, and public consultation should come into the picture. Will it be before or after the execution of the JBA, or will it be before or after the execution of the MOU? And then also there are issues on the easement because under our guidelines, the easement required for the emission project is 40 meters, but uh, uh, the proponent of the PR is uh, Get support as a support for the So for the DNR LGUs, there's uh, some some overlaps then in 
limitations of ECC and the power of the use to the claim. So in conclusion, uh, we, we state that the reclamation sparks economic activities and generates revenues for the government. However, reclamation should not only be confined within the economic parameters, but uh, should be evaluated also in the context of environmental protection and conservation, disaster risk and climate change mitigation that are science and evidence-based. There is also a need to harmonize the policy gaps among national government agencies tasked to review and approve reclamation projects, including those that issue compliance certificates. We also say, state that mainstreaming nature-based solution in infrastructure development reclamation is also the key to sustainability and viability. But before I end, that ends my first part of the presentation, but uh, you, you recall the Secretary mentioned about the Mandamus uh, ruling, wherein we base our uh, uh, assessment and the implementation of activities in Manila Bay. Just to highlight the roles, uh, I just, we just want to take the opportunity, the presence of different agencies, to highlight the obligation responsibilities of different agencies. And to show to you that it is not only the DNR who is responsible for the rehabilitation of Manila Bay, but all the agencies as well. So, next slide. So, in 2008, the Supreme Court issued the Supreme Court Mandamus in Manila Bay, and uh, the Supreme Court directed the Dirty Government Agency to clean up and rehabilitate and preserve Manila Bay, and restore and maintain its water to SB level to make it fit for swimming, skin diving, and other forms of conduct regulation. For the information of the non-lawyers, uh, Mandamus is one of the legal remedy from the court, appealing to the court to compel any tribunal or any branch of government to do or perform an act that is required by law to be performed by them. Meaning, the performance of the act is part of the agency's mandate or duty, but it continues to neglect or ignore by not performing such act. So it is purpose in Madame's order of the Next slide. So going to the responsibilities of their agencies, this is very short on the So ang main, ang lead ng implement ng, uh, ng implement ng rehabilitation of Manila Bay, the DNR is the primary government agency responsible for the enforcement and implementation of activities for the protection of environment and natural resources, is directed to fully implement its operational plan for Manila Bay Coastal Strategy for the rehabilitation, restoration, and conservation of Manila Bay at the earliest possible time. The DNR is also directed to uh, convene a meeting of the different agencies to make sure that all the mandates are being uh, undertaken by the different agencies. For the DILG, uh, the, court, the Supreme Court uh, directed the DILG to direct all LGUs in Metro Manila, Rizal, Laguna, Cavite, Bulacan, and Bataan to inspect all factories, commercial establishments, and private homes along the banks of the major river systems in the respective area of jurisdiction to determine whether they have wastewater treatment facilities or hygienic septic tanks as prescribed, as prescribed existing laws and ordinances and rules and regulations. If none be found, this LDU shall be ordered to require non-compliant establishment and homes to set up set facilities or septic tanks with reasonable time to prevent industrial waste sewage water and human waste from flowing to the these rivers, water waste levels, and the Manila Bay under the pain of closure or imposition of fines and other sanctions. For MWSS, the court, direct, uh, the court directed MWSS to provide, install, operate, and maintain the necessary adequate wastewater treatment facilities in Metro Manila, Rizal Cavite, where needed at the earliest possible time. For LUA, uh, through the local water districts and in coordination with the DNR, is ordered to provide install, operate, and maintain sewerage and sanitation facilities, and efficient and safe collection treatment and disposal of sewage in the provinces of Laguna, Abite, Bulacan, Pampanga, and Bataan, where needed at the earliest possible time. For DA, the part of the culture through BIFAR, the court ordered this agency to improve and restore the marine life of the Manila Bay. 
It is also directed to assist the MDUs in Metro Manila, Rizal Capite, Laguna, Bulacan, Pampang, and Mataan in developing using recognized methods and fisheries and aquatic resources in the Manila Bay. For PCG and PNP Maritime Group, in accordance with uh, Section 124 of RA 8550 in uh, Marine Law, in coordination with each other, shall apprehend violators uh, of PD 979 RA 8550 and other existing laws regulations designed to prevent marine pollution in the Manila Bay. For PPA, we have a representative for PPA. The court ordered the PPA uh, to immediately adopt such measures to prevent the discharge and dumping of solid waste and liquid waste and other ship generated waste in Manila Bay waters for vessels docked at port and apprehend the violators. For MMPA, as the lead agency and implementer of programs project for flood control projects and training services in Metro Manila, shall it be, shall it dismantle and remove all structures, construction, and other enforcement established for building in violation of RA 7279 and other applicable laws. For DPWH, as the principal implementer of programs and projects for flood control services in the rest of the country, more particularly in Manila Bay area, in coordination with the DILG and affected NGUs, PNP, Maritime Group, HDC, and other project agencies, shall also remove and demolish all structures Constructions and other enforcement built in breach of RA 7279 and other applicable laws. Next slide. For DOH, within one year from the finality of this order, the need if all licensed septics and sludge companies have the proper facilities for treatment and disposal of legal sludge and sewage coming from the septic tanks. For that end, shall integrate lessons on pollution prevention, waste management, environmental protection, and life subject and the life subjects in the school curricula of all levels to inculcate in the minds and the hearts of students and to them, their parents and friends, the importance of their duty towards achieving and maintaining a balanced and helpful ecosystem in the Manila Bay and Tartarus in the Archipelago. And last, for DBN, shall consider incorporating an adequate budget in the GAA of 2010 and succeeding years to cover expenses related to the cleanup, restoration, and preservation of the water quality in Manila Bay in line with the country's development objective to attain economic growth in manner consistent with the protection, preservation, and revival of marine waters. So soon, we will be convening the interagency to discuss the requirements and obligations as by directed by the Supreme Court to the other agencies. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, um, it's very interesting how you are were able to highlight um, the, the different mandates of agencies no, on, on areas such as Manila Bay. But also, uh, if you could note on the presentation of Mr. Briones, he raised another valuable policy, no, a law, no, uh, which we often forget, and that is uh, the one uh, referring to RA 7160. The, the value of um, decentralization and devolution in, in this process. And um, I kindly again um, request you to part this, no? and we will come back to it because that's very important, so particularly in the issuance of the and land use. Uh, Dr. Jeff Castillo, both of them are from uh, the environment, economic, uh, uh, are, both of them are members of. Uh, weeks, um, the Resources, Environment, and Economic Center for Studies Incorporated. <coughs> Friends, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Indeed, this is a good uh, opportunity for us to make everyone aware that uh, this is indeed uh, using the word a critical item that has to be addressed because over time, Dr. Anna has uh, been addressing this. And there is no way. The invitation was sent to me and I said, Dr. Ran, would you like to come and join me because this is something that we have been working together. And so she agreed, and so that's why we are two of us here. So we titled this uh, Balancing Trade-Offs. We'll explain that later on. And there are two items that we would like to present in this uh, forum, this dialogue, evaluating 
and analyze and create the gender forms so to be to be part of activities. Other than that, we're talking about the different tool, which is the economic impact. So let me begin by uh, asking Dr. Ra, because we thought this was a sort of conversation and uh, some of the highlights and experiences that she had in her reclamation because she also presented this type of uh, discussion in the Philippine Institute of Environmental Studies. So that is the first slide. Um, in any action that we do, there are benefits and there are costs uh, that happen currently and through time. And we are all being mindful of whether that effect is possible, which is the goal that is that action, or if it's negative, we don't control that action. What do we consider when we look into trade offs, economic values, benefits, and costs? Next slide, please. First, we need to be mindful that the experience all over the world indicates there is a more multi-dimensional concerns of land reclamation. But showing here only uh, that of Dr. Dam uh, on the left uh, corner, where uh, the reclamation started in the fourth in the forties and still is going on and um, has contributed to making uh, the Dr. Dam the number one port in the world. Um, Right now, though, there are questions being raised about continued uh, reclamation for port development because of the challenges of environmental issues. Um, is the Philippines ready to think of um, more reclamation for ports uh, to expand its maritime industry? We have a lot of folks now. Uh, is that a possibility for us? Big question. The other important question to note is the experience in China, where about 52% of the coastal, coastal wetlands have already been cleaned. And a recent study of one large area uh, on the right hand side shows that um, the compensation fee for the loss of aquaculture, farms, salt, tans, shallow marine waters, and the fisheries and the extramarine waters were not sufficient uh, visually that uh, damage to uh, those who uh, bore the cost uh, was not properly compensated for. Do we compensate uh, those? Uh, the station that EIA is already advanced, so the, the proponent for the contractor is already invested. And so that is already an issue because uh, if you do a uh, benefit cost analysis after uh, that, so after that that means you already, and the, the next question is, who will do the benefit cost analysis? Is it the private sector? Is it the agency, the proposition to go through? Or is it the NEGA? Because NEGA, <laughs> <is, laughs> for a project development manual, has uh, established that a benefit cost analysis should be undertaken. But since NEGA, in terms of the decision, has been taken out recently, so we will be able to undergo the process and this is still let me go to the next slide and tell you that there is not, uh, we're only dealing with one cost uh, reclamation, that is the coastal reclaimed land. And there are actually different types of reclamations, and this will require, in fact, indeed, different approaches for uh, evaluation and benefit cost analysis or even economic impact analysis. So there are various forms of reclamation, and so we need to customize. So let's say we customize, uh, which means we have to consider several factors. In fact, uh, from a regional perspective, as uh, shared by uh, uh, Mr. J.A. Freeman earlier, we have to ask the question, when you say area appearance, what area are we talking about? Is it the area where the reclamation will be undertaken? Or should we include the impact area? Or even the regional economic impacts? So what is that area appearance that we are going to talk about? So the, when we talk about uh, reclamation, we need to have comprehensive evaluation of the viability, the visibility, and overall effectiveness of reclamation in affected areas or even in influenced areas. So that means that uh, we need to also really think about uh, benefits. So go to the next step, please. Uh, not only the financial benefit, which is the concern of the proponent, 
But we have to talk about societal benefits, and this is the concern of benefit cost analysis. In many cases of the benefits, let me just point out that in the Philippines, Dr. and I were discussing, has there been any uh, uh, benefit cost analysis done for any inflammation in the country? The only one that we did was for the entire world of Manila Bay, which would be the economic subject system of biodiversity under the UNEP project. And uh, it took a while for us because it was the first implementation of benefit cost analysis. In fact, the Cordova project did not have any benefit cost analysis. We only have cost estimates, not the benefit cost. So there's no benefit inside the computation. And so it really involves us as a simple positive and negative. The societal benefit, which means includes environmental benefits and other benefits that are not typically accounted for in any financial analysis by a proponent. So the societal benefit should include improved public access, and so on, uh, enhanced ecological functions creation of green spaces, and the promotion of sustainable development. Sometimes we think of sustainability as a simple term, but we talk about long-term uh, sustainability. How much analysis should go to? Is it going to 10 years, five years? The development phase for uh, regulation is 10 years, but its impact is the end of 10 years. So we do analysis not only for the development phase, we compensate not only those affected by the development, but is it possible also that we should compensate those who will be affected negatively by the consequences of the uh, implementation of especially the land development and the act of acquiring land. So let me just present to you the next slide. Uh, what do you think about this is only in fact, this is only one part. We did this for Manila Bay, this was the image was earlier presented by Mr. GJ. When we look at coastal regulation and uh, for the matter, we're looking at interconnected coastal and marine ecosystems affected by regulation. When we did the economics of ecosystem and biodiversity for Manila Bay and the unit, the focus there was only on the Lapache or the Las Pinas Paranatic Critical Critical Habitat and Habitat and Ecotourism area. But it is a small area. You're talking about regulation that will be undertaken for the entire Manila Bay, which is about 26,000 hectares, including the previous in Cavite, up to Baraan. And that's the five provinces. Each of them have different components. And so we will be affecting different ecosystems there. So you have mangroves, you have sea grasses that are often neglected, you have estuaries, marshes, mudflats. We think that mudflats are nothing in it, but these are actually habitats for invertebrates, which are have beneficiaries in them, fishers. And so if you take them out, you're taking out the beneficiaries' benefits. So the interconnection includes also the open waters. And you you will know that even Manila, Manila Bay was used to be the spawning ground for sardines that goes out to Manila Bay, which are so sufficient by commercial fishers outside. And this will be done as a result. So that means that we really have to do some analysis. Let's go to the next slide, please. We don't, we don't only do uh, just the immediate, the direct impact of uh, regulation. We should consider the impact pathways. So this is just one example, for instance, on dredging. <coughs> what is the impact, impact of dredging? Just the dredging alone. For Manila Bay, the proposed dredging site to, for the regulation the San Nicolas Show. I don't know if you don't know where the San Nicolas Show is. It's one area just north of Cavite that will be proposed as a dredging site for Manila Bay. And some of the hydrodynamics experts are saying it will have some changes in terms of the beaches areas affected. So these are the things that, so what if, we, when we do benefit cost analysis, we look at it from the biophysical impact, and then of course the socioeconomic impact, and then ecosystem services that will be affected. And when we talk about ecosystem services, these are services that generates economic activities. So this is kind, this kind of analysis is being undertaken. Take a look at the next slide, an example for mangroves. Next slide, please. And this is how this is sort of a framework for what, how we do this, we talk about removal of mangroves. So it has 
several implications like the loss of habitat, nutrient cycle uh, disruption, coastal vulnerability. If we go to the go up and go to the loss of habitat, you have declining species. So without that declining species, it's simple, but it's actually also disrupting the food web and the food chain. If we're talking about disrupting disruption of the food chain, we're talking about declining in fish productivity. And who are affected by the fish productivity? This will be people who are dependent on uh, food supply, dependent on the livelihood, and even the supply chain for these products. So we're only talking about uh, disruption of or the loss of habitat, loss of species. The loss of the ecosystem services is another matter. Loss of water filtration, loss of carbon storage and sequestration, and waste regulation. We take out the macros, we take out the ones that filtering the plastics that goes into the open waters. It's supposed to be trapping, and then that means you have taking, taking out uh, uh, pollute, pollution removing mechanisms. You're talking about atmospheric pollution, and you have pollution of open waters. And I will show you an example here in our analysis. So you have reduced fishery damages to our uh, climate-related due to hazards okay, resulting from typhoons and tropical cyclones and so on. Go, go down to the coastal uh, vulnerability. So if we take out the map roads, we damage infrastructures, even those that are constructed in the, on top of the reclaimed land. So that means that will translate to higher expenditures, higher defensive measures, costs, and even increasing insurance. And so these are the factors, and that means also translating into uh, higher expenses for government and also Take note that many of these, if you go back, the only ones that are being measured here in, the, in many of the ana financial analysis are the path benefits for a pipe contractor or even future benefits or economic benefits that goes into our GDP, gross domestic product. Yeah. But there are other values that are ignored, for instance. And so that's the disruption of livelihood. We call this a negative externality that has to be taken care of. And so uh, I'll bring back to Dr. Ann to explain how do we then translate this into values that should be integrated into benefit cost analysis. That will be factored in in here, here I'm sorry, PIA versus the current. So the next slide shows the different values in economic terms to natural assets and the ecosystem services they're from. Uh, there are methods for doing this, and I did not detail the methods, but I provided instead the examples that have been done in the Philippines in the past. We already have at least 50 or even 100 natural resource and environmental economists uh, all over the country, uh, based in universities, public and private, think tanks, and the government. And this is latent expertise that could be tapped to do evaluation and uh, implement the system of environmental and economic accounting, which the government has committed itself to. That system, or NCA, is, has already started. It has a roadmap. If that intensifies, it will not only provide economists with a link between ecosystem services, nature, and economic sectors, of which many of us uh, are taking care of, uh, but also uh, beyond the national level, more important at the local level, provide us with the data that is needed to assess decisions pending on whether a reclamation can happen or not, at what scale, where and when, um, and uh, if it does happen, what are compensation levels, uh, what are correction mechanisms that are needed. So there is such uh, an effort going on. Now, the difficulty matters depending on what we're doing, and really requires a lot of collaborative work, not only by economists working with uh, environmental scientists, but also hydrologists, geologists, psychologists, behavioral scientists, and the like. Why not? Uh, why so, rather? Because it's comprehensiveness requires concerted action to looking at decision-making points. Next. 
Yeah, let's go to the next slide just to give us an idea of how the simplified framework of benefit cost analysis will be undertaken. Take note that we said trade offs because there will be trade offs of removal of our natural capital. So we have a natural cost of landscape on the left, my left, your left, and uh, coastal reclaimed land. So you're converting a natural capital into a manufactured capital. Those that are benefiting from natural capital would likely be removed from the picture and will be substituted by those who would be benefiting from uh, manufactured capital or built up capital. And so we're talking about mangroves, beach areas, wetlands, mudflats, sometimes north. And then we convert them into built up land, seawalls, breakwaters, drain systems, and mariculture. And so we have to do some evaluation. What if we maintain the natural capital? What would be its benefits, financial benefits, and what would be its costs? And so we take out what would be the net benefit of those. And we also go back to the drawing board and say, what if we transform them into manufactured capital? And so we also analyze the benefits, including financial, capital, capital benefits, and also the environmental and economic benefits. And then we compare both. So if the net incremental benefit of reclamation is positive, then that's where we pursue uh, reclamation on the assumption that it has positive and taking care of uh, benefits. And so we now say, ask the question is, who will benefit and who will lose? What is the trade-off? So the next slide, uh, I'll leave it to Doc and then work also for the succeeding slides to explain. In this slide, I would like to stress the importance to go beyond financial analysis. Financial analysis is usually done with both of the components. They are usually uh, private sector working with government agencies. Uh, the, the area, the target area for growth, even without the proposed reclamation or other projects, like shown in this uh, dash blue line, solid, uh, uh, yeah, blue line, and the that benefits it of the project. When the financial analysis is usually done, you could have a thin red line at the top. That is the net benefit valuated in financial terms, not economic terms, would be very high uh, because the negative environmental externalities are not measured and some economic benefits to society are not valued. So there is an overestimate of the attractiveness of a proposed reclamation project. Um, but once the proposed reclamation project is analyzed in terms of its environmental impacts, then uh, one would factor in the costs and benefits uh, of, of the environmental impacts and the environmental mitigation measures. So you would have this solid green line where the net benefit, benefit cost analysis there was a financial analysis, but we could not access that. And so what the environmental economists based in Cebu did was to look into the environmental impacts and value these environmental impacts. And they are enumerated here, they include fishery losses on site, uh, bleeding from the reef, uh, pollution uh, control services in the time of flood, a lost carbon sequestration loss, and so on. And what it eventually arrived at was a, uh, an estimate of 3.3 billion pesos in net present value terms. Um, and of course, if any uh, economist or he saw that does not look at a point estimate, always looks at scenarios, whether assumptions are pessimistic or optimistic. And that is why you have the second row where you have pessimistic, optimistic, and most likely scenarios and uh, simulation of the impact of discount rates. And then now um, uh, prescribes 10% as a discount factor. So all the results still indicate negative values. Not, the researchers could not add this to any of the earlier benefit, uh, net benefit estimate because there was no such net benefit estimate. That, that, that's a worry for us because uh, the many prospective recognition projects involve huge amounts of money, large areas, and uh, considerable 
your population along the coastline. Uh, so the question that we should ask is, we are considerably expanding um, horizontally. Uh, what about vertical expansion? What about those models that are so big, so big and can be converted to socialized housing and distribution? So anyway, um, we really have to think about our growth patterns. I'm sorry, I have another question and another question. Is it possible to do that? Is that in the next yeah. two minutes? Okay, so thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is what we did in Formula Bay. Uh, now I tell you. And she will notice here that uh, there were two different types of houses. Yes. Okay. Uh, one is the one that was built in 
on how our reclamation uh, is actually affecting you know, shipping lanes no, and um, uh, to the, the routes uh, that the maritime industry. And uh, friends, please welcome the manager of the dredging and survey department of the Philippine Ports Authority, Mr. Rolando Perez. Sir? Thank you, Mr. So, we have a DBA. DBA for, for this question as well, how we discuss. And instead, I am here to assist the PRA and the ENR and the open vote and the open discussion. Thank you. So, we have a lot of vote. So, can you share a lifeline? The PRA has a lifeline. And uh, with that, can we please just give our resource persons a big round of applause before we go to the before we go to the Q&A, and now we can invite our, um, you know, our, our, our uh, participants here to be share the questions that we have uh, to our uh, uh, secretariat. Earlier, we had a question from Joshua uh, from the media. The question is, why are we here? What is this uh, dialogue for? Um, would you like to respond to that? Please enjoy us. I'll leave question. Oh. In the line of the several, as mentioned in the open forum in the Secretary, uh, we said that the nation can really boost our economy, but at the same time, we really need to look at the impacts of this reclamation, specifically in the Manila Bay area. We mentioned that there is an order coming from the Supreme Court to rehabilitate the storm in the bay. But despite this order, there's still a lot of projects, ongoing activities in the middle bay. So that's the issue. What will be our policy direction on this, uh, this uh, situation? So what are the parameters that we need to consider when we implement reclamation projects at the same time rehabilitating the storm in the middle bay? So these are the concerns and issues that we need to address because this is really existing, uh, existing uh, occurrence that we need to really look into and evaluate further. As mentioned here, what, is the, what would be the benefits, the cost in uh, pursuing reclamation? What is the benefits and cost if we have a day in the day? So these are the reasons why we are all here. We uh, uh, look at the global practices in the first panel, and then we're looking at the policies that uh, we need to review, analyze the gaps, so in the hope that we can improve our implementation of our people. Thank you very much for that, um, to be honest. Um, you see, there in that earlier conversation, we actually saw overlapping mandates uh, around the whole issue of reclamation. And there are multiple agencies who have um, uh, you know, responsibilities uh, as well as the local government units. But let me uh, uh, proceed first to the questions uh, before we we move forward. There's a question here from Zoom for attorney uh, Grant. Have there been instances where a proponent submit a proposal for less than five hectares and then apply for another five hectares a few years later? This would relieve them of the need uh, for EIA and hydrodynamic uh, modeling uh, for each submission. Yes, sir. Well, uh as far as our records are concerned, uh, we have not encountered a, a less than five and then application of another five just to do away with the hydrodynamic modeling. However, there are projects, uh, basically projects of the government, which initially uh, would be five hectare, less than five, and then Another case is being implemented on a multi-year. So it could be a dependent of a uh, GAA. It would be dependent on uh, justifying the budget of the particular project. Uh, I think that's the only instance. But for uh, regular reclamation projects, uh, we haven't encountered a you know a less than five and uh, another less than five just to you know skirt away from the requirement of hydrodynamic modeling. 
uh, however we have encountered. Uh, by the way, when we talk about reclamation, we talk about a regular reclamation that undergoes a permitting from PRA. But, you know, uh, um, which uh, there are cases, reclamations which are unauthorized and illegal. These are implemented without the approval from the DNR and PRA and other government agencies. This is where our focus right now is because they don't have legal engineering design, they don't have air appearance. Sometimes they have the ECC because they, you know, they usually think ECC is the permit or whatever, but it's not a permit. So they have endorsement from PSGUs, but they don't have air appearance and permit from PRA. These are the, the examples of the less than five. So actually this, uh, this takes much of our time because it happens nationwide. We're just focusing our conversation here mostly in Manila Bay and Cebu. But the less than five without the necessary permits are everywhere in the Philippines. So I think our focus should be focused on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And that actually puts a lot of um, challenge to our local government units who are, who are here. Uh, 